Right. Uh, well, hello, Keith. Hello. Uh, thanks for helping us out on this this video. You're welcome. Uh, thought we'd start by uh, looking sort of racing through your career, which is a fascinating one. Um, I noticed you, you started by joining what was then to have a pedals in Stevenage working on Blue Streak. Um, which, which I remember because when I was, it was my primary school days, so it was 10 when I was 10 or 11, walking to school, we passed the Blue Streak structural test rig. And occasionally there would be a Blue Streak in this structural test rig, which was right by the A1 as we went past. So that, that was that was my involvement, but yours was a bit more profound, wasn't it? Oh, well, a little bit more, yes. Uh, I was uh, recruited to work in the trials department, basically writing procedures and help write, help write the countdown for Blue Street. This was before we'd ever fired one fully uh, uh, fueled at Spade Adam. So, uh, in fact, one, I think one of the first procedures I wrote was uh, the procedure to put Blue streak on the stand at C3, and then I was got in my first involvement with safety. I, I was given the job of uh, looking at the, the in-flight safety system and writing checkout procedures for that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so you, you you ended sort of straight into systems engineering, which same as I did, probably for the same reason. We both got physics degrees. And given that system engineering was never taught at university in engineering degrees, we had the same experience of the subject as the engineers who'd come in. Exactly, yes. <laughs> yes, in fact, I wasn't called a systems engineer till I was recruited by Bendix in the States. Yeah, that was sort of 66, if I'm reading your CV correctly. Yes, yes. And, and uh, you were working on the the lunar surface experiments that the astronauts put on the moon yes um bendix got the contract bendix aerospace in ann arbor michigan and they got the contract to make the experiments that the astronauts would put out on the lunar surface uh the problem was they didn't have enough engineers to do the job so they came over and recruited 27 british engineers and in fact um, more than one from uh de Havilland propellers at the time oh. And, and what did they get you doing? Well, they, because I'd been involved in launch operations, in fact, by that time, I um, graduated up from writing procedures to working for TDB9, which was a group which was basically an, an ELDO group who were coordinating the trial, the various aspects of the trials from the diff different stages, the German second stage, the uh, the uh, sorry, the, the French second stage, the German third stage, and the Italian satellite, which was the first one that was going to be flown. So we were we kept flying over to uh, Paris and and working with with all the different stages to try and make sure our trials would run smoothly. And and you ended up also on the sort of launch operations on the Apollo launches. Yes, because of that experience, I was. <clears throat> that's why they recruited me. They had nobody who had actually been directly involved in launch operations, and uh, so I was recruited to start planning uh, the activities we would do at Kennedy Space Center. Um, <clears throat> we had to look obviously look at the design, try and decide what we were going to do where. At first, we were thinking of integrating the experiments and the the um, sub palette we had, which had all the data systems in and the power conditioning uh, down at the Cape, which would mean quite a significant facility and, and checkout operations down there. But they decided they could do that far better at, uh, at Bendix and uh, then ship the whole thing integrated down to us for the remainder of the operations that we had to do. I mean, yeah. you, you, you had to put them onto the vehicle while it was on the pad. Yes, uh, that was Apollo 11 we did. And uh, in fact, later on, on the later missions, I think it was 15 onwards, we did it on the pad. But for 12, 13 and 14, we did it in the operations and checkout building. Yeah. Put it into the lunar module before it was put on top of the Sutton. The only thing we did on the pad was to install the... Uh, plutonium fuel capsule into the re-entry body that was mounted on the outside of the lunar module. We did that at T minus 14 hours. Uh, 
which was exciting. Yeah. I understand 14 was particularly entertaining. Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> we uh, <clears throat> we got this half critical mass of plutonium just inside the spacecraft lem adapter on top of the Saturn V, where you have a very small space between the, the wall of the adapter <clears throat> and the lunar module, and all the lights went out. And the, the chappy holding the he he worked for the Atomic, en Atomic Energy Commission. He was holding this thing. And uh, the only light we had was a gentle red glow from the uh, plutonium. And I called up the uh, countdown controller, uh, gave my call sign and said, we've got a problem on the 525 level, which is they knew where we were working. And the whole net went silent because <laughs> they knew we were handling this piece of plutonium. And I said, what's the problem? I told them and they said, wait one, typical NASA. About 30 seconds later, the lights came back. Somebody <laughs> pulled a plug on the swing arm on the launch umbilical tower. Oh, so um, the Apollo program r ran down and you uh, you came back to England. Yes, yes. Uh, it was Apollo was coming to an end. They'd recruited everybody they needed on the shuttle and, and, and uh, space uh, Skylab. Uh, there were no real jobs going. Uh, I would have had to go back to Bendix in Ann Arbor, which I didn't really want to do. So uh, we decided to come back to Europe because I knew Europe's space program was picking up. Yeah. Yes, but, but not so much the British one, but you, you did actually go back to Stevenage. Yes, back to Hawker City Dynamics as it had oh, become. To be technically correct, it was to happen when you left. It was Hawker City when you you got back yes and I, I, I must tell this story there was one guy i knew who who joined i think about the same time you had in the 60s and he'd been in stevenage all his working life pretty much at the same desk and on his retirement do he listed all the companies he'd worked for sitting at his desk <laughs> something like 15 companies he'd worked for um just by sitting at this desk <laughs> um so 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 uh, you were working then on the um, orbital communications test satellite OTS. Yes. And I, I then worked on its successor ECS. So uh, you know, I took I took over from you on the second one. Um, but you very quickly went to the European Space Agency, which was a young organisation when you joined. In, in fact, yeah, when I joined it in April of uh, seventy five, uh, it was strictly still transiting from the Ezra Eldo organization to ESA. Yeah. They were, I think it, it actually happened in the month that I joined that we were officially ESA. And I was working on Space Lab, which was to fly in the space shuttle payload. Yeah, which is a manned laboratory. So it was crew inside it. It was a pressurized laboratory, uh, apart from the pallets, uh, which were actually made in Stevenage. Yes, yes. Um, it was Europe's obviously for Europe's first venture into manned spaceflight, and uh, we had uh, an American safety man over, and he was he was the principal engineer, on, or principal safety manager, and under him there were two uh, sections. One was uh, safety, one was reliability, and I was the safety. Um, yeah, now. So you were involved when, because because Space Lab got in as it happened very early, because the first thing the shuttle actually flew as a payload was one of these pallets. Yes, yes, and uh, we had um, there was a lot of foresight gone into what we did on on uh, Space Lab because nobody was experienced in safety in Europe in this kind of safety. So um, my boss. Uh, got together a safety specification he worked with uh, we had a number of people from uh, from nasa working on space lab and we got a lot of data from skylab and from other um, areas and wrote a safety specification that initially we could work to while we were doing our safety analyses our, our hazard analyses and our reliability analyses um, as well so we had a, a, a uh, a, a double approach to, to getting the whole thing safe and reliable. 
And uh, what we were doing with the pallet was using our safety spec to make sure that uh, the pallet could fly because it was an engineering model pallet that NASA wanted to fly on the settle, second uh, shuttle mission. Yeah. And uh, so we were going through to requirement by requirement that was applicable to the pallet. Um, we had an interesting experience. We, um, we had two requirements which were applicable. One was that we, you were not supposed to have any negative margins of structural safety. Yeah. And we were going through the stress analyses and we found a couple of areas where they had slightly negative margins of safety. And the stress engineer at the end of the report had written that uh, just tightening up uh, certain torque uh, values, that the um, tolerances on the torques, that should bring that in and there should be no problem. Uh, the problem was that they didn't have any torque values specified at all. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in the end, we had a long discussion about this, about the skill of the, of the fitters, etc. But we ne needed something that could be bought off by inspection. Yeah. And in fact, some bolts were so critical uh, in the end, they had to use extensiometers to measure the extension of the bolt as you tightened it up to yeah. get the right torque value on. Accurate yeah. enough. Although I, I think I, I know at the time, because... Uh, I was getting a bit of a reflect from that. It was going around the site. Um, they did actually find that compared with just a, a torque wrench, a skilled fitter can actually be more accurate than, than, a tor uh, than, a, than a torque wrench. But you can't measure the skill or you can't exactly that he's done it right. Yes. This lab, the next vent, European venture was Columbus. Uh, which you were on on the early stages. Yes, I was, yes. yes, I was. Yes, Bob was on that. Yes, um, I uh, I was involved in the the early design phases and in the uh, the first two design reviews. But at that time, I was getting ready to move over to um, to the line department to help set up the the human spaceflight safety section. Yep, uh, which you did. Again, right early in. <laughs> yes, we uh, well we did. We we got a couple of people in to go out, and uh, one of them was an American. We got, and he went round. He went round a number of space uh, organisations, uh, commercial, and NASA, and uh, who else did he go to? He, he did the French, and he compiled a very very good document, which was a. a, a uh, a, a document which summarised their approaches, and uh, we could learn a lot from that. And and uh, he, he made comments on things he thought weren't um, weren't the best way of doing things. And we used that and our own experience on Space Lab to set up the first set of well, the safety policy for the agency, and then uh, the safety requirements that we would apply to uh, programmes from then on. Uh, how do you find the difference between NASA's approach to safety and ESA's approach to safety? Um, <clears throat> the approach that NASA was using at the time, um, I didn't get too much uh, input on the shuttle, but I got a lot of input on what they were doing on payloads for the shuttle. And it was a sort of a cookbook approach. We don't want this to happen this is what you do. Mm -hmm. um, whereas what we were trying to do was to do the systems safety, system safety engineering approach, analyze the design, look at, try and develop the, the safest approach we could within, uh, which would be practical that we could actually uh, fly. Uh, so we were, we were concentrating quite a lot on analysis on particularly uh, hazard analysis and failure modes and effects analysis because of the, the, the big interface between safety and reliability. Uh, and then we were using as a backup the, the set of safety requirements. We, we set a set of um, system level safety requirements first off, which, um, mm -hmm. we, uh, which we applied. And we were hoping to develop a, a really detailed set of safety requirements, uh, rather like the requirements that are used for aviation, 
but uh, we could never get the money to do that. Yeah, I suppose in some ways because um, the Apollo 13 failure was almost a classic of a systems failure um, as opposed to a, cook, a, a failure because there's something in the cookbook you don't want. You know, it, it, it's one of these things where if you don't analyse the complexity of the system, you don't understand how your failures can propagate. Yeah, they, NASA did do a lot of um, failure modes and effects analysis, but I, they, I never came across them at that time doing hazard analysis. Yeah. So they didn't catch that if you lost the tank, the way you were going to lose the tank was it's going to explode and that then takes out the second tank. Right, yes. Yeah. And, they, and they didn't really understand the significance of having an electrical motor driving a, a stirrer and a heater for that motor inside a tank of liquid oxygen and of course with with flammable materials in that environment with the insulating wires and the windings on the motor yeah yeah is it maybe we should go through the whole story about how that tank failed um because it shows that it was quite a complex it sequence. was a very, yes it was a very complex um sequence of events the originally that tank was supposed to fly on Apollo 10. Um, during the installation process into the service module, it got dropped. Uh, so they they couldn't use it. They put another one in. The tank was sent off back to the manufacturer. They they pressure tested it, put it on the shelf, mm -hmm. and it then got put into Apollo 13. Uh, what they didn't realize was because they didn't do a full functional test on it, the, the stack pipe inside the tank had got dislodged. During the countdown demonstration test, you, you do all your fueling, so that tank would be filled with oxygen, liquid oxygen, and then you empty it mm -hmm. between then and the, the actual launch count. They couldn't get the oxygen out, so they decided to boil it out by turning the heater on in the tank the heater for the motor what nobody had realized was the voltage that was being used to drive that heater had changed between apollo 10 and apollo 13 it had gone up so when they ran this heater all night to boil out the oxygen they damaged the insulation unfortunately it didn't blow on the pad yeah because then we would have okay we'd have we'd have had we'd have had a an accident on the pad but we wouldn't have lost the mission because yeah. we fixed it all um the interest there's an interesting story about this it was a very still cold night when they were doing this and the the gaseous oxygen drifted down the side of the saturn five yeah and there was a culvert at the bottom at the bottom of the the uh, fire trench underneath the uh, the saturn five and this lot of oxygen pulled in there and ran along this culvert, this, this ditch, to, the, to a culvert under the perimeter road round the uh, outside of the, of the pad. <laughs> in the middle of the night, a policeman was driving his car around there. This oxygen had poured over the road surface and his car just went up. He got out, but yeah. there was just a melted heap of metal on the road surface. <laughs> I think somebody should have got an idea this the vehicle shouldn't be launched. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other warning that, that in hindsight you really should have paid attention to is why couldn't you vent the tank? Exactly. That that really is a warning sign there's something wrong inside the tank. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, right. Well, um, so uh, there's... Uh, how effective do you think things like Famicas and hazard analysis are? Do, do they catch everything? For me, because I think for me, because are pretty good. Um, hazard analysis, it depends on how well the analysis, an analyst really understands the design and whether he gets in early enough. One of the big problems is, is getting access to the program when, when they're going through the very, very early phases and looking at different design options, different uh, technologies, seeing which ones they want to use. Because at that point, you can put a lot of safety in for very little cost. 
Yeah. You can identify what hazards, what what are the hazardous characteristics of the technology. You can maybe get them cons to consider alternatives and uh, and really drive safety very successfully. I, I know this is a thing that you've you've hammered home ever since I've known you about. You you should design the safety in from the start. Yes. And, yes. And with with aircraft certification, that that is really what that process is supposed to do, isn't it? it in aircraft certification, right from the start, you're addressing the safety issues on the aircraft, and the safety is designed in. Yes, that's right. And uh, of course, you've got a, a lot of lessons learned available. Yeah. Um, so they they can do a more. Um, well, in fact, this is how aircraft safety progresses at the moment is an event happens and you learn the lesson from the event because and all these events are so bizarre that they're not you, you're never going to catch them in just a think tank process. Right. Right. Um, but of course, in the early days of spaceflight, at least they couldn't do that because they were flying on ballistic missiles that had, um, had already been built, designed and were sitting out in the Dakota Plains ready to bomb NASA, uh, bomb Moscow. So um, so they, they did a thing called man rating, it being the 60s and all the astronauts were men, of course. Um, but man rating is a, a somewhat different approach, isn't it? Yes, it is, because basically, as you say, you're starting with a, with a ballistic missile and you want to put a human being on top of it. Uh, you've got to look at what you can do to keep him safe. And within the practicality of, of using a, an existing vehicle, yeah. which is why uh, Mercury and Gemini and, and Apollo all had escape capabilities during the launch phase. Yeah, and, and the Soyuz too. Yes, Soyuz, particularly Soyuz. We've, uh, Soyuz has been very successful at recovering people from accidents during yeah. launch. Yeah. The Soyuz system has been used in anger. So, yes, uh, yeah. I think it's been used three times now. Um, oh, I forgot the statistics. One of them, though, was a proton launch, and there weren't crew on board. Uh, uh, there, uh, there was there was one which was which happened at launch, and the crew were on board. Then there was one with a stage separation problem, and then we had the recent one. Yeah, the, the uh, but the. The, the point is that, that, A, it's expensive because, as you said, trying to do things after you've designed it is, but it's also nowhere near as effective, is it? No, no. If you if you can design the safety in, you can, for example, if uh, NASA had chosen storable propellants for the shuttle, if they'd been able to, we wouldn't have had cryogenics in there. We wouldn't have had insulation on the tank and, and it wouldn't have been coming off and damaging the wing on Columbia. It's quite true, but as an engineer, I must point out the stored propellants don't perform well enough to enable you to get it. <laughs> true, <laughs> true. It's a typical well, no, I have, I have, engineer, uh, engineer <laughs> argument. Uh, I, have seen, I have seen a calculation done by, and an, it was done at a propulsion conference, and this guy was proposing that uh, he changed the equation they use for picking the propellants. And what he wanted to figure in was the mass of the of the tankage, <laughs> whether you had to insulate and all this kind of thing, what you would save if you didn't use cryogenics. Yeah. And he came up and reevaluated propellants, and guess what he came up with? HTP kerosene. Um, <laughs> I, I suspect he's got his sums wrong, but it was a good approach. <laughs> It is. It's, it's interesting that um, SpaceX are using lots of kerosene. Um, yeah, again, that's for different reasons, and they're not effectively doing single stage to orbit. No, they're not. And they're moving to both them and uh, Blue Origin are now using methane oxygen. Uh, yes. But then you're getting to cryogenics again. Yes, you are, but you haven't got as, it's not quite as bad as hydrogen, fortunately. <laughs> Nothing wrong with hydrogen. Perfectly. <laughs> I, I like hydrogen. But anyway, yeah, I, 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 the way I've always seen the difference between uh, certification and man rating is in certification, you certify the vehicle safe to fly, and in man rating, you certify the crew. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yes, I suppose that is that is <laughs> that is true. Um, the, the one thing that I felt, and again, the Apollo shows that a bit, and, and and I see it also in the approach to space station safety, is the space industry doesn't pay enough attention to secondary failures, what I call secondary failures, which is they worry about I've lost that function. They don't worry about how has that failed. What's the consequence? Has it is it going to start a fire or is it going to destroy something further down the line? And there's not enough this worrying about the effects of a failure rather than just I've lost the function. Um, I probably disagree a little on that. We did try to cover that partly by putting in requirements that um, redundant strings and backup strings should be independent. And anything used for safing would be independent of the function being safed. Mm -hmm. So you, you you try and separate things off so you do prevent f failure propagation or, or effects propagation, uh, which is what they didn't do, of course, on, on Apollo initially. But it's interesting on space stations, all the hazardous events on space stations have always been a secondary consequence of a failure rather than a primary consequence. They're, they're always, losing a function doesn't necessarily create the problem, it's something else has happened. Yes, that's that's true. It be partly because, <laughs> funnily enough, space stations are more uh, benign environment than a, than a launch vehicle. Very, my point is that, <laughs> uh, for example, on the Mir space station, they quite frequently lost all electrical power when they get into eclipse, the batteries couldn't see them through the eclipse. So the station would go completely lose its electrical power. Uh, and the astronauts were sort of, well, thank God the noise has stopped. We get a few, we get a few <laughs> minutes quiet before, before you, you get round and the power comes back on as the sunlight hits the arrays. So, um, but if you lost electrical power, you're dead. <laughs> Yes, exactly. It was very interesting on Apollo 12 that uh, it was struck at least twice by lightning and they lost a lot of power. The circuit breakers tripped, but the vehicle itself was hardwired and partly because the, the uh, vehicle acted like a Faraday cage and all the main current went down the outside, the, the guidance system never blinked. Yeah, that was a close one though. It was a close one. Pete Conrad was very, ready, very ready to uh, push the eject button. Yeah, but, uh, they got it all back up and uh, off they went. People never mentioned the elephant in the room was what what had it done to all the pyrotechnics that had to fire to separate things off and uh, get them back safely. <laughs> Fortunately, NASA's NASA's pyrotechnics were very well qualified for, uh, I think, one what one amp no fire, which is uh, quite a stringent. Yeah, and in fact, ESA ended up qualifying their initiator for the, to the same level. You were telling me about the pyrotechnics that you guys put on the moon in the surface. Yes, experiment. yes, we had a number of safety issues with uh, with uh, the experiments. One was our killer power source which meant we had to carry half a critical mass of plutonium, yeah. uh, which was protected within a re-entry body, which successfully re-entered on 13. But we also had quite a lot of ordnance. We had, um, on two missions, we had two rocket grenade launchers with four grenades in each for a seismic um, exploration. Uh, we had to design those so that if they didn't fire, that they would be safe for years to come. Yeah. yeah. The electrical power for those was all supplied by a, a small thermal battery and it only ran for three minutes and you had to do everything to get the uh, grenades away in that three minutes. All the batteries were the battery. and there's no way you can ignite exactly. it. Yeah. Exactly. So it was relatively safe, although it had still had a reasonable amount of, of explosive on board. Um, we had a similar thing with... Um, with uh, an experiment on 17, which we had explosive charges, which were put out manually this time instead of fired by rockets. And they were commanded to, to be fired once the crew had come back. Yeah. 
Mm. And they ran on a similar system. They were only live for a certain amount of time and then they, they went dead. So that uh, thinking ahead, if people are wandering around on the lunar surface and they find these things, they're going to be safe, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, one, one thing, you, 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 you said that for Mika's uh, generally are effective, hazard analysis, not quite so. Maybe, maybe we should just discuss what is a hazard analysis um, and why it doesn't work necessarily quite as well as a Formica. Um, well, okay, first of all, I think uh, it depends on how well the analysis understands the design. I think we've already said this. Um, the process is to, the way we did it at ESA was that we had a set of generic hazards, um, flammability, that kind of thing, toxicity, etc. And it's quite a long list when you when you really look at it, because it in, you, you include um, induced environment by the system itself. You mm -hmm. have to look at natural environment, and then you have to look at the um, te technology of the system. What have you got in it? What propellants are you using? What materials are you using? Um, so we have this generic list, and what we do is to look at the applicability of that generic list to the design we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And then we say, oh, yes, that's applicable. Then you have to develop an engineering model of how that uh, is manifested in the design. So is it in a side of pressure tank? What's mm -hmm. in the pressure tank? What's what, et cetera. And you can decide then on what are the likely problems that, uh, that can occur and what can we do about it? Can we eliminate things that might cause the the um the hazard to propagate so that's basically how it's done it's done at a very um almost superficial level at a very gross level in preliminary hazard analysis where you're looking at paper designs and you're looking at the the uh, general configuration of the system uh and what's the system design phase in, in yes the, the early system design phase and then it goes into space, more, more space be in space speak Yes, and then you go into more and more detailed analysis uh, into subsystem level and down into equipment level sometimes where you, 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 you may be looking at a pressure vessel or like an oxygen tank that we had on, on 13. Yeah. That's what should be done. It isn't always done or hasn't been in the past. Uh, and trying to get management to support this kind of activity and give the access to the safety engineers um, to the data is uh, it has been a problem. It's also a problem of availability of the data because you've got this. Um, if you're building a big complex system, getting at it all is is quite difficult. So yeah. you try and get safety engineers um, working for prime contractor, subcontractors, equipment people. You, you you want safety people at all levels embedded in the in the program. And I'm not sure that NASA had that approach. I don't think they have their engineers right down at the, the, the small level, at the lower level. Which which led to problems on the space shuttle program, of course. Yes. Where they, um, well, they committed the first cardinal sin, which is to make a massive configuration change, and effectively a requirement specification change, and then not go back and redo all the work they'd done on, on, on the original sort of aircraft-like shuttle. That's right, and uh, they missed a lot as a consequence. Yeah. So, <laughs> and of course, they were, being, you know, they were being driven so hard by cost, which is why we had the compromise design. Yeah. And, and then um, the, the, the solid motors that failed on the Challenger were, were a consequence of, um, or, or, or the, the thing wasn't fully appreciated because the qualification testing didn't fully duplicate the loadings that it would have when it was on its in its operational phase exactly yes the um <clears throat> the qualification testing was just with the, the, the solid booster sitting on its side and they fired it yeah. uh, whereas in, in its use on the shuttle um the shuttle hydrogen engines light first and they're offset to one side of the solids so you put a big bending moment on the uh, solid motor mm -hmm. and uh, as that motor is flexing you then light it 
<laughs> yes. I think my foot flex back. I mean, you would tell me they, they do ask. They timed it so that it was it was it was it was actually vibrated. It, it oscillated back and forth, and you fired the the solid motor when it was vertically moving through its vertical position. But there were still resonances in the in the uh, solid motor case. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, when you oh, I was at the uh, NASA when uh, they were doing the investigation, and I saw the photograph that showed the the, uh, the puff of smoke at the launch. Yeah, and um, once you know it's there, you see every time you see that that photograph of the footage, you can't miss it. It's, it's yes, chilly. I you actually also I understand actually at the hearing when um, Feynman pointed out the uh, the problem with the row rings. Yes, I was lucky to go with my boss, uh, my department head actually to um, NASA. We were going to for a meeting on something else, and it just turned out the challenger happened and they didn't cancel the meeting so we we happened to be there when roger's commission was sitting mm. and uh, we happened to be able to sit in on that on that meeting when Feynman put his piece of o-ring rubber into his ice water mm -hmm. and he'd been tipped off by sally rice about it yeah the astronaut yeah I, I i got the impression from some of the people i've been talking to there was almost a a sort of secret conspiracy to make sure the truth would come out and fireman was the vehicle to make sure that uh, nasa wasn't going to get away with it um, that, that's right i think there was there was uh, i think an attitude of the rogers commission mainly from rogers that uh, there was a, a feeling of trying to protect nasa yeah i don't think that was the case for the for the all the other panel members but uh, yeah. there was definitely a feeling and you get that from what uh, Feynman said in his book about it it's it's uh it's absolutely the wrong thing to do if you want safety though isn't it I mean you shouldn't be protecting organizations and things if you don't have a completely open system where failures are explored to the full and errors established you know not not to allocate blame but you don't get lessons learned if you don't explore the things through to the end exactly that and near misses i think we we discussed this uh, earlier in the afternoon yeah i'm very uh, very keen on this thing that you should uh, investigate near misses as as if they they were events yes it's that way you're catching uh, there's a number of times particularly on aircraft where you find that three or four times this thing happened and but nothing happened, so no one did anything about it. And, and Challenger, they they had a whole series of events showing that this could happen, which, to some extent, were being ignored. Yes, they were. They they they, they were not color correlating all their uh, information. They were missing the influence of temperature, yeah. because when you when you looked at it in hindsight, mind you, hindsight is always a hundred percent. Yeah. When you looked in hindsight, you could see the worst cases of, of any blow by on the O-rings was happening when the temperatures were low. Yeah. No, I, yeah, it's a very complicated story because the engineers knew that. But at the key meeting, they only had about 30 minutes to prepare the presentation. So they used uh, an, an overhead which was designed to show something else. And we're trying to argue the temperature effect on an overhead that was trying to illustrate something else. And um, it's a, a classic case used to be used by one of my colleagues to illustrate information display. A classic case of yeah, the information's in there, but there's no way you're going to get it across. Yeah. But to be fair, yeah. They, they didn't have enough time to knock up a, a new overhead because in those days you didn't have PowerPoint and you couldn't do it. <laughs> That's true. Yes, it was all cut and paste and. <laughs> Yeah, so so have you had a good good life as a system a safety engineer? Yes, really a very, very good life. We're um, very interesting because in developing our safety policy and our, our safety pro program requirements and our technical requirements, we interface with a lot of people, other space agencies, uh, uh, civil engineering people, um, 
Technical University Delft who were involved in safety for chemical plants and nuclear power. We went to Sweden to talk about nuclear safety. Um, so it, it, it was very, very stimulating. And of course, being involved at the level I was, I was meeting all sorts of people, astronauts, cosmonauts, um, NASA managers at, managers at quite high level. We have a, I, I can give you a very funny story about the, the safety manager who took over after Challenger. I won't give his name, but um, apparently told us this story that uh, one evening they were going to, at, at his house, they were going to have a romantic evening. And uh, his wife was in the bathroom and they had candles all around. And uh, he came in in his dressing gown, caught one of the candles and had a massive fire. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, that's um, yeah. I've I've got a similar story about our propulsion group. Uh, the structures group used to hold a firework uh, thing where we quite illegally modified fireworks to do spectacular things, and the propulsion group muscled in with one of their with a design. And it didn't leave the ground. It didn't have enough thrust to leave the ground. <laughs> you've got to be careful when you've got a professional reputation about what you do. <laughs> yes. There was, in fact, there was an amateur rocket club at Kennedy Space Center. The guys that were working on Saturn V used to go out there at the weekends and launch, launch amateur rockets. <laughs> yeah, that's... that's um... Yeah, that's yes. Yeah, so I I won't go into the details of what we were doing because it was uh, yes. As a safety engineer, you'd have kittens. <laughs> uh, but um, to just if I can just sort of finish up with a few few points, I'd like to be able to emphasise to people. One is, although um, quality and safety are normally handled by a, a single block department it'll be subdivided but there'll be a block department in most organizations dealing with that um i, I think it's careful you've got to be careful about not confusing particularly safety with reliability that just just because your system is reliable doesn't mean that you're necessarily safe exactly um i think um we we talked about uh this uh, manager we had with the uh, with the Porsche and uh, him driving out into the countryside from into a cornfield with his car with the hot exhaust. <laughs> yes, very reliable car. Are you safe? No, you're not. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's um, the other thing that'd be interesting is, is this aspect of safety policy. Um, did ESA and I, you, know, you probably know more ESA than NASA? They they had a safety policy about what they were going to protect with their safety program. Did that include the the hardware or was it just people? It did include the hardware. We it, but we always prioritised it's the people first. Um, and in fact, we we the hardware was I think third on our list. It was people, environment, and then the hardware. So, oh, so it was there were there were environmental concerns, and that would be back in the eighties, would it? Yes, yes, that was back in the eighties. So ahead of the game on that one, because a lot a lot of people didn't pay a lot of uh, attention to that. One of our requirements was an environmental one, which um, I had problems getting through. We had a basic requirement that you should not create space debris. And we were looking at requirements for passivating boosters, for uh, you know, bringing down energy, uh, anything that was energetic in, in a vehicle that was, that was um, uh, finished with. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're now in a situation where we actually have Kessler syndromes in some orbits already. So, yeah, that, that um, I, I I must admit I was a bit. Uh, it's almost ironic that that uh, they, they it was at the the fourth 
European conference on it, but they are held every five years. So this is over 20 years of conferences. Um, and that conference, they decided after 20 years of looking at it that they've got a Kessler syndrome in orbit. Um, well, yes, because you had lots of conferences, but you, you didn't do anything. No, there's been no international requirements. There needs to be an international agreement on this. You need to passivate everything. You need to catch your explosive bolts on stage separation and things like that. There's all sorts of things that need to be done. Yeah. Oh, well. I guess both of us have retired now, so uh, we just leave the mess. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, there is a, an, an international organization for the advancement of space safety, which was started by a guy who worked for me, who took over my job, in fact, when I left ESA. Yeah. And uh, that's doing a lot of good work, and it, it works with, with all the agencies. Yeah. I think, uh, except uh, China. Yeah, I've had uh, several contacts with them. Um, you're not just plugging them because they gave you a special safety pioneer award, are you? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm plugging them because um, Thomas, who's, who's uh, I think he's, yeah. he's not the vice, he's not the president anymore. I think, but he was the president. Um, really took up um, what I left and ran with it and did a great job. No, I know him and a uh, great guy, great guy. Uh, appreciate his work. Um, yeah, and he's got a lot of a lot of famous people, safety people um, from the states involved with him. Who are, who are. Do, you, do you think there's a lot of difference between the way the states and Europe do it, particularly NASA and ESA? I think they're they're they're, they're approaching. They're getting together more now than they were. I think they understand. We had a great difficulty getting them to understand what the way we were working and once we did once we got that they were fully supportive of us and i think i don't, I don't know whether they learned anything from it but they certainly improved i think their uh, their approach certainly uh, on what we're doing now on artemis it looks uh, it looks a heck of a lot better than it has yeah. in the past um if, if it can be sort of um national stereotype is which is always a dangerous thing but americans do like to just have a series of rules that if you know where you know follow these rules you'll be all right yes yes and ultimately that's a dangerous thing with safety isn't it you've got to have yes, a, yes. Um, you've got to have some brains behind the rules you've got to think outside the box definitely yeah well well keith thank you very much that's Ooh. um that's that's wonderful and uh, appreciate your time. You're welcome. I've enjoyed it.